Funding for Idaho Reports is provided by the friends of 4, 10, and 12, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by a grant from the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation. Good evening. When the Speaker of the Idaho House of Representatives suggested two weeks ago that the size of state workforce could be reduced by 10 percent, 1,200 state employees reduced from the workforce, objections were raised from Post Falls to Pocatello. The governor, he said it was an unrealistic idea. A state senator said the speaker was intent on, quote, butchering state government, and a member of the State Board of Education called the proposal irresponsible. In other words, Speaker Tom Stivers has been receiving his share of flack lately for that proposal. The speaker is going to join us in just a moment to talk more about reducing the size of the state workforce. We'll also be hearing tonight from a state senator who says Tom Stivers has just publicly said what a lot of other lawmakers talk about privately. And we'll of course hear some dissenting views on all of this, beginning first with producer Bruce Reichert's report. There are approximately 12,000 public employees in Idaho. And by now, probably every one of them has heard of House Speaker Tom Stiver's call to reduce their number by 10 percent. A lot of these people need more of an incentive. And uh, I say that quite uh, constructively. I think there's a lot of people in state employment who really are there because they've been built up and built into the system, and they're good, they're very good, but they don't have enough work. Not surprisingly, Stiver's press conference held during the dog days of summer stirred up a firestorm of protest, particularly among state employees. On behalf of state employees, we're outraged at that suggestion. We think that it's totally ridiculous. In the last 10 years, state, the number of state employees has actually decreased by 14 percent already, and that's why the state's population has gone up at least 28 percent, close to 30 percent. We'd have to respond to fewer and fewer of the complaints we get on child abuse, and ultimately resulting in a lot more problems on the other end of the scale. To me, it's cost effective to respond to the families and the children in trouble and try and alleviate those problems. Because we all know that the prisons, the mental health, the hospitals, the welfare waiting rooms are filled with people that can't cope and those problems originate back in the family system. You know, I think a lot of state employees feel like they've been treated or, or felt like they're third-class citizens anyway. And I think they're, you know, uh, the way we've been strapped the last few years, I think there's been a, a lot of employees that have really worked and put in a lot of time to get the job done. And when they, you know, statements like that are made, um, yeah, they, we do need more incentive, and those kind of statements don't help as far as giving any incentive to get in and really get the job done. This isn't the first time that Stivers has called for the state's workforce to be cut, but it is the first time he actually named names, or at least agencies. Among those attacked, the Department of Revenue and Taxation. Looking specifically at fiscal year 1984 and the number of employees that we had in the Bureau, uh, per employee we uh, recovered in cash or its equivalent some $225,000 per employee. That amounts to approximately $9.14 uh, in cash or money collected for every dollar spent in the program. So to cut this agency would not be cost effective? To cut the audit and collection program uh, by 10 percent or approximately 17 people would cost in excess of $3.8 million if uh, he just went across the board. Stivers also took on the Division of Financial Management, saying workers there should spend less time on their computers and more time managing other state agencies. Well, I guess my immediate response after his press conference was that half of the staff was at that point out managing state government, or that is they were working with agencies and developing the next year's uh, budget requests. Um, the other reaction was that computers have helped us a great deal in living with the budget cuts that we've had over the last eight years. Since state employees are by and large producing services or providing support to state 
the state population. We have then the number of state employees per 1,000 population going down something like 17 and a quarter percent. So where you can find the possibility for further reductions in staff, I really question. Even though Idaho's population has been increasing, there are actually a thousand fewer state employees today than there were eight years ago. That in itself, claims Stivers critics, show that Idaho public employees are hard at work. But Stivers isn't convinced. In fact, he singled out employees at Idaho's state-run liquor stores as an example. But at this particular store, the record shows that each employee sells over $160 of liquor per hour every working day of the year. And in case the speaker should just happen to wander into either of the two state-run liquor stores in his own hometown, state workers there want it known that they are indeed working, with each employee bringing in on the average over $140 each hour for every working day of the year. House Speaker Tom Stivers, who has helped generate this controversy, is with us now. Mr. Speaker, it uh, sounds, for example, like those folks at the liquor store really are paying their way, aren't they? No question about their paying their way. Private industry could double their profit if it was run effectively and efficiently by private industry. I have no quarrel with the money they're bringing in. They always use that as an excuse. Look, we're bringing in a profit for the state. But how many employees do they have in these liquor stores? I know how many they have in Twin Falls. They're not, it's just not required to have that many people working. The gentleman on the film a minute ago said that each employee brings in $169 an hour. That figures out to what they said in a one release, 19 bottles he sells every hour. A checkout clerk at Safeway 10 times does that much in an hour. They're not cost effective in their labor. Well, well, so, well you're, the, the, the question there, though, is whether the state should be in the liquor business as opposed to the right. number of state yeah. employees, yeah. right? But if they'd start in, you know, just recently, Mark... Uh, well, do you, uh, want, you want the state to just be a out minute. of the liquor uh, business? Just recently, the state was remarking in their liquor industry that their revenue was down markedly. Their revenue went down markedly, and their costs went up. Why did their costs go up and their, and their revenue down? They were selling less, but the same number of employees are on the line drawing higher salaries all the time. Something's wrong. Would you like to see the state out of the liquor business? Yes, I think they should. A lot of that's been talked about for years. Get them out of the business. Let it back. Get into private industry. That wouldn't go in the legislature, though, would it? Oh, I think it will. You bet. Would you like to... Are you going to try that next time? Well, I'm not going to try it, but I'll bet you it's been uh, floated uh, many times in the past and probably will be again. How about the, uh, the example you used of the Department of Revenue and Taxation? You heard uh, the fellow on the videotape say that in a, in a sense, by having the people that they have, they're able to bring in more money to sure. the state treasury. And he's talking about audit and control department, and right. they use the same argument as like, like the Mayor Daly syndrome in Chicago. Fire the policemen and, and, uh, and firemen. That isn't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the extra labor in there, the ones that's manufacturing puffery, publishing documents for them, publishing statistics that really don't mean that much as far as getting the work done. Sure, we need, we put on, what, 19 more auditors a year ago to bring in more money? What did they do? I don't have any hard evidence yet of the extra tax evaders that they brought in. They did two or three things that were real cute. Spent a lot of times going around trying to collect ta sales tax from uh, YMCAs on their memberships, going around uh, trying to collect sales tax on uh, packaged meat. If you kill your own elk or deer, right. then they butcher that and they're going to charge you sales tax on that. Butcher your own uh, beef that you grow yourself, have it packaged in a, in a coal plant, they're going to charge you sales tax on that. Now they must have spent a lot of time digging out that information. I'm not talking about the auditors that are going around, I'm talking about their extra staff people. So in that area, there is, a, in your view, a 10% reduction would be possible setting aside the audit, yeah. the audit area. Yeah. I think what needs to be done, and this is what I stressed at the, at the press conference, not that you go into every department and cut down 10%, but somebody should be looking into it, and no one is. No one is going around and classifying jobs in that department to determine whether they're doing effective work anymore, whether that job classification is needed, or whether that person is really doing the productive work and can be terminated. And as I understand it, that's where the Division of Financial Management comes in. Well, in you know, that's one area that probably should be looked at. That's, the, the, again, the fox watching the chicken store, the chicken house. I don't think that's the right department. It either should be uh, the legislative auditor's office or the legislative budget office that dig digging into that because having the governor's office look into state agencies I don't think would be productive either. 
I mentioned finally at the beginning uh, some of the reaction that various people have had to your suggestion, the governor calling it unrealistic, other people calling it irresponsible. What kind of reaction have you received? Ah, beautiful, beautiful reaction. I have not received one phone call, one letter from any, any state employee objecting to what I said. I have received many telephone calls and many letters from state employees saying I was perfectly right in my statement, but my figures were wrong. What was wrong with my figures? Too low. I think it was high as 30% could be reduced in some departments. I've got letters and everything, telephone calls from them. I have not received one phone call or one letter from a state employee dissatisfied. And here's why. A good state employee that's really productive knows good and well that if some of those non-productive workers are terminated, there's a good chance that the productive worker's salary will be increased, and that's what I tried to plead when I had the press conference. Cut down uh, 1,200 employees, amounts to $14 million a year, take $7 million of that, revert it back to the general fund, use the other $7 million to increase the remaining employee salaries. You'll get more work done, more incentive done by those remaining good employees than you ever got with the additional 1,200. A lot of people don't want to listen to that, but that's what, that, what would happen. That's what happens in private industry. We'll come back, sir. Thank you. Two dissenting views now from Bob Moore, the business manager of the Idaho Service Employees Union, a union that represents some state workers, and from Marty Peterson, the director of the Division of Financial Management, the governor's budget office. Mr. Peterson, let me ask you first, what do you make of the speaker's contention? Well, I think, first of all, Mark, it's, it's totally unrealistic to think that uh, uh, over the years we haven't been looking at employee counts. Uh, I think taking a look at the number of full-time state employees there are and, and uh, uh, comparing the FY84 uh, or 1984 uh, figures versus the 1978 figures, you'll find that we have about, I think, about 8.4 percent fewer employees right now than we did in 1978. Uh, I I think that uh, taking a look at those employees, uh, taking a look at, at various programs, is an extremely important part of the entire budget process. Uh, I think that... Uh, and it's your argument that that process is going on all the time. I think that, that process is going on, and, and I would also say that uh, uh, with respect to the, the uh, uh, fox washing the uh, hen house comment, uh, I think it's not only appropriate that the governor's office be looking after that, but I agree with the speaker. I think it's highly appropriate that both the legislative auditor and the legislative budget office be doing it, and if they haven't been doing it, if they aren't doing it, it's about time they woke up and started doing it. Well, let me just ask you, what would happen if there were a 10% across-the-board reduction in state employees beginning, say, tomorrow? What would well, happen? We're not talking about across-the-board. Well, I never did see a across-the-board reduction. A 10% total reduction. Yeah. Okay. Some Fair places enough. could be 10% total reduction, Mr. Peterson. Say in the Department of Health and Welfare. Well, I think I think it's it's difficult to really precisely say what the impact's going to be, Mark, because uh, uh, the Department of Health and Welfare, for example. Uh, runs uh, a lot of different programs, and it all depends on how the department would de be decide to uh, spread that cut. Uh, we're to the point now that it is probably not realistic to consider cutting, doing 10 percent across the board cuts, uh, and I, I think the speaker has probably come to that same conclusion. I think what you'd have to look at would be to totally shut down complete programs, and uh, uh, since 1978, so you, you're really talking about changing the face of state government, in your view? Well, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that is something that has been done. We have a number of state programs that have been shut down over the years. Uh, we also have a number that have been shut down, uh, uh, such as public television, that uh, after, after they've stopped funding, uh, public outcry has been great enough that, that they've reinitiated funding. Uh, so, you know, I think it's difficult at this point to assess exactly what the impact would be other than to say there would be a lot of programs that would go out of business. Mr. Moore, let me ask you, how have the state employees that you represent and your union represents responded, reacted to, to what the speaker has suggested? Well, of course, they've acted negatively. They don't, they don't think that the charges are well-founded. They continually ask, give us specifics. Uh, to follow up on the question that you asked Marty, I can tell you what the impact would be. Uh, the impact would be profound and the impact would be terrible for the citizens of this state. It would be bad for everyone who travels on the state's highways because the, the highways are having a difficult enough time being maintained and if, and if state employees were cut, if highway maintenance workers were cut, the roads would be that much worse. It would have a profound effect on the hunters and fisher, fishermen in this state because if we start cutting the fish and game department, the people who protect the resources of this state, then those resources would be depleted. It would have a profound effect on any 
aging person who is who is at any time unemployed or seeks the services of the Department of Employment and looking for work because the, the fewer workers there, the less service the public is going to get. And of course, it would have a profound effect upon uh, the... Speaker, you heard this, let me just interrupt and say that the Speaker says he has letters here from state employees who said just the opposite of what you're saying. Well, I'd like to see those letters. Um, undoubtedly, there's, there are inefficiencies in any, in any organization, but to make, in my opinion, irresponsible statements about 10 percent, 20 percent cuts is totally unjustified. So uh, I, I'm sure that if, if we got into a letter counting contest, uh, I could come up with considerably more letters from state employees who disagreed with the speaker than those who would support him. Well, finally, before we move on, let me ask both of you gentlemen about another point that Mr. Stivers makes, that in effect, by making these kinds of reductions, you would benefit the remaining state employees who could be paid more and who perhaps would produce more. Mr. Peterson? Well, I think in, in some cases, uh, uh, that would be true. I think there are, are a great many cases, though, where it isn't going to be true because I, I'm not sure what the criteria is that you use to go ahead and get rid of those people. The best of my knowledge, the way that you go about getting those people is you have to go through a reduction in force. And if you go through a reduction in force, uh, that doesn't uh, guarantee you that the least productive individuals are the ones that laid off, are laid off. Uh, just the reverse could be true. Uh, my guess would be that it would be a mix. You'd end up with some good people uh, that you'd lose. You'd end up with, with some bad people that you'd lose. So I, I don't think that kind of a cut is any sort of an assurance along those lines at all. Mr. Moore? I, I totally agree. And, and, and furthermore, uh, the fact is that, is that many, many state employees are overworked now. The case of, of prison guards, for example, who are working outrageous numbers of overtime hours. Uh, eligibility and food stamp workers, especially during the, th the recent recession, were working at, at times 12 or, or more hours a day, coming in weekends and not even being paid for it, not claiming compens compensatory time because they realized that the work wouldn't go away. And so there was no point in getting time off because they just have more work uh, when they came back. And I think that's what you'd see even, to an even greater extent if the number of state employees was reduced. We'll come back, gentlemen. Finally now, a view more sympathetic, perhaps, to what Speaker Stivers has suggested, that view from State Senator David Little, an eminent Republican and chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. Senator, you said, or at least I saw you quoted as saying, that the Speaker had and essentially said out loud what a lot of other lawmakers say privately. Well, I think so, Mark, and I think one is the Department of Administration and the custodial services in our state buildings. And we've been, the reference has been made here to the legislative auditor. He audited. He saw what it was costing for this custodial service. He went out and found out what custodial service was costing private enterprise. And the state, in its wisdom, and they should be complimented, contracted it out. Uh, we estimate a savings of 200000 to 250000 a year. Ten years is a couple of million dollars that they saved. Uh, the liquor stores have been brought up. In 1975, we had 205 liquor stores, and and thanks to good administration, they're down to 126. They're out now to eight. Or excuse me, uh, this, uh, that was employees. Outlets there were 100. Now there's 56. The agency stores where they're out in contract in 1975 was 28. Now it's 80. They're moving in the right direction, but I think that we have to. Legislature has to ride herd all the time. I, uh, on this, I don't know if I would agree with the speaker that a flat across the board, and I don't believe from what he said that he means that. But there's bound to be the, and the thing that, and I've advocated whether it's possible or not. But in private industry, on our ranks, when I was about 14 years old, we had a 50-man hay crew. Today we have four. We're buying sophisticated equipment, uh, data processing equipment. If we buy more, there should be some labor savings there. And if there was only some way, and I'm sure that the private industry, that if there was some way to compensate our department heads where they could institute efficiencies, I think Speaker Stiver's 10 percent would fall into place just immediately, where they would be compensated for what they could do. But look at the reduction but that we the, have. Uh, right now, as I, as I think I'm hearing you say, there's no incentive for them to make the those de kinds the of The department savings. head, and this yeah. is, is an incentive process. And of course, and we look at the figures of the, the state employees, or the term that we use, FTE, full-time equivalent. And of course, it has come down. The highs were 75, 1975 and 76. 
But of course, that's when the federal government was putting in a lot of money in CETA workers. But we reduced this with the with the serious reduction and the rollback in funds in '83. We reduced it, and I have yet to have one complaint of anybody that said, "By golly, you guys didn't give us enough service." We've got by, and why not keep riding herd on that all the time? And granted, there are places that they're probably going to need more, and, and I think that uh, Mr. Moore mentioned the penitentiary, but a lot of that has been in design. I mean, the way it was designed, there was errors made there. I think that the, the people in charge there will tell you that. And there are efficiencies that can be instituted, but just to say we're going to keep the number, and we got the institute of efficiencies. And to me, the, what we did in the custodial services is privatize it, and I think there's a world area out there where we can do that. Okay, well on that point, let's open it up and invite any of you to get back in whenever you want to. Mr. Peterson, how about that? Are there some places where we could privatize, so to speak, state government functions? Well, I, I think that's, that's absolutely correct. It's certainly something that we're always looking at. Uh, uh, I think the, since the liquor dispensary is, is one of the agencies that the speaker's targeted, uh, uh, I'd like to follow up on, on uh, Senator Little's comments and point out that uh, uh, as recently as 1979, we had 85 stores out there employing almost 200 employees. Now we're down to 56 stores with 126 employees. And uh, many of those stores those are state have owned been contracted stores. out. Mm -hmm. Those are state-owned stores. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, our number of contract stores has increased from 48 in 1979 to 80 today. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly if the legislature uh, would, would uh, give the uh, administrator of the dispensary the authority uh, to do it, I'm sure that uh, there would probably be even more of those stores. The uh, uh, comment on custodial services is, is also a good point. And uh, uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. We had another example uh, where we tried this with the Department of Corrections. Uh, we turned over the entire food service out at the state penitentiary to a private company to provide food service and uh, got uh, about halfway into the first year of the food service and all of a sudden the company came in and uh, said, by golly, we miscalculated our, on our bid to you and uh, we're going to need a, a substantial increase in our reimbursement, which the department didn't have in their budget. The department sat down, took a look at what they were proposing, and decided that the state, in fact, could provide those services uh, at less cost than their contractor was and, and has been forced to take over the program again. Mr. Speaker? I think one thing that uh, needs to be clarified a little bit, uh, Mr. Moore mentioned uh, several agencies that would be uh, hard or disastrous to cut employees out of. He mentioned Department of Employment, Department of Highways, and Fish and Game. None of those have anything to do with the general fund not a one of them. So you can lay that aside. I suspect we could talk about reducing employees in the highway department and maybe lower the gasoline tax. But that's where they get their funds. It's not from general fund. Fish and Game's the same way. They mentioned health and welfare, and that's one of the people I got a call from. A person who's worked for eight years in the Department of Health and Welfare says that we could reduce some of his staff 30%. Some of the people in the news office could reduce 30% and still get the work done. I had uh, a lady talk to me in the last two days that worked for 16 years in a state agency, and she quit because there just wasn't enough work to do. She was felt she was wasting her time and idle and not working enough. So it's there, and people should be looking into it and, and cleaning out that type of activity. Would you make those letters public? No, not not unless permission was given by those people because well, I think is, their jobs would be in danger. Would you ask them to get in touch with our office? Certainly. Yeah. I, because I, you know, we're very serious about this type of thing and it's, it's yeah. difficult for us if there are problems out there to track them down yeah. if people don't bring them to our attention. We, to our attention. Well, I, got some, I got some real wild ones. Fine. I got uh, some that burn your hair because uh, some of the complaints I'm getting from state employees about wanting to do more work for the agency they're working for, but they got people spread out all over the place doing bits and pieces and none of them working, working full bore. Senator so, Little made the point a moment ago that what really is lacking here is management the ability for the managers to make these determinations. Is that your feeling? Mark, here's, uh, here's one thing I think, uh, I don't have a pat solution right now. State agencies come into the uh, Joint Committee, the appropriation, Finance and Appropriation Committee, each year to make their budget requests. Those state department heads come in fully loaded, 
with their request. They come in just as fat as they can, knowing that perhaps there's going to be some cuts made somewhere, and eventually there are. That isn't the total solution to the problem. There got to be something, get into those agencies, see what the workload is, look at the job classification, determine whether or not the work even needs to be done. A good example, a lot of these programs go on, and built into that program is a work project for a employee to do something. And over the years, that becomes uh, unnecessary, and that should be looked into. But they still uh, keep building them up. Mr. Peter? Peter. Well, I, you know, I could give a, I could read off a substantial list of, of programs that have been in operation in state government for various reasons, uh, have been removed in, in the last few years. Uh, Consumer Affairs Division of the Attorney General's Office, Adoption Services at Health and Welfare, uh, the Department of Law Enforcement's Drivers Counseling Program, uh, the Mine Safety Program, uh, the Department of Labor, uh, the Speaker's old favorite, the Women's Commission, uh, the Meat Inspection Program at the Department of Agriculture, uh, and then I could also hit some that, that have gone out but have come back in, public television funding, uh, the uh, University of Utah Medical Program, uh, the uh, dues. Well, how about the point, though, that uh, that there's not enough uh, ability for an individual manager, sort of on the ground in a specific mm -hmm. location, to make determinations about who he needs and what he doesn't need? Well, I I think there's always uh, always room for additional flexibility for managers. I I think that uh, uh, you know that's that's an essential tool if you're going to give a manager an ability to really crank out a quality product. The problem, one of the problems we have, is that. Uh, and I don't know if it's a problem, but one of the realities that we're faced with is, is that we do have state laws that govern uh, a lot of the activities uh, of agencies. We have a, a personnel system that uh, uh, is, is uh, 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 operates under some fairly tight constraints, that type of thing. And uh, no, I would agree that there are, are some constraints there, uh, some of them good, some of them bad. Senator? Well, when we've talked about it a lot in the Joint Committee and with the Legislative Auditor, and that is performance audits, mm -hmm. to go right in. Uh, I happen to be affiliated of, in a minor way with a grocery chain. And if they have a store that's bad or not, do they put a task force in there and they find out? And I, I think that it's something that we, we ought to pursue all the time, is to come in and keep updated. And as I mentioned, with sophisticated equipment today, we should have, we should be able to get by with less personnel. What we do, we get, we get sophisticated equipment, and then we have to upgrade the personnel to make them an authority or capable to, to operate that kind of uh, equipment. And to me, it's, it's kind of cancer. It kind of feeds on itself. Let me give Mr. Moore the last word in 15 seconds. Well, that's absolutely true. I mean, and, and the state is continually automating its operation. But you obviously can't have a machine go out and investigate a case of child abuse. You can't have a machine uh, interview and tailor the, the needs of an unemployed person. You can't have uh, a machine uh, dealing with, with prisoners. I mean, the, the, the state primarily provi provides human services, uh, services that uh, our society has deemed that are very important and that would not efficiently be provided by private enterprise or would not be provided at all. Got to go, gentlemen. Mr. Moore, Mr. Peterson, thank you for joining us tonight. Senator Lindley, thank you. Speaker Stivers, we appreciate it, gentlemen. Right. Just a brief update finally tonight on a story we covered here Monday. The story was about asbestos in public schools in this state and what some school districts are trying to do about it. In Bonner County, Idaho yesterday, voters approved an override election that will provide $165,000 to remove asbestos from 16 school buildings in that district. 56% of those voting in favor of the override. That's all for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. I'm Mark Johnson. Good night.